look at some um, powerful and impactful stories. And so we started off this series looking at Paul. We started off this series talking about Paul, and when Paul was done, we ended with this. It says, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where your life was or is headed. When the light of Jesus shines into your life, everything changes. And so we focused on that, and then we came to King Saul. Okay, we came to King Saul, and unfortunately, his story is a little bit sadder. Um, it's not as, uh, as joyful as Paul's. As we come to King Saul, and what we saw was that King Saul stands as a clear reminder of what happens when we take what we've been blessed with and we believe that we are great and we are above failing. His story is a reminder when it becomes all about us and our gifts and our abilities become all about us. It's, it's, it's dangerous and it's dangerous to live a life like that. It's dangerous to live a life where, hey, I believe in God and I, and I, and I have a relationship with God, but I want to live my life that it's all about me. And the fact is that anyone can screw up, anyone can fail, anyone can fall. And then last week we came and we talked about Adam. And we talked about how, how Paul refers to him as the first Adam in terms of Adam and Eve, but then he refers to Jesus as the last Adam. And the reason why is because through Adam's disobedience, okay, we were separated. Humanity was separated from God. But Jesus' obedience brought humanity back to God. It restored. It gave us the opportunity for our relationship to be restored. The reason we can sit here today, the reason we can sit here today and, 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 and worship him, and the reason we can sit here today and, and be grateful for all the things that God is doing is because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, allowing for us to restore, allowing for us to reconnect that relationship. And so today we're going to talk about Thomas. Today we're going to talk about Thomas and the disciple Thomas that, that unfortunately has the moniker, has the nickname. Now it's not the nickname that the Bible gives him. Okay, in the Bible his nickname is actually Thomas the twin because it's believed that he had a twin. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not really sure why else you would call him Thomas the twin. That's the nickname the Bible gives him. The nickname we give him is what? See, you all knew it right away. Right away. Poor guy doesn't stand a chance with you. Right away. Everybody like, Dowdy Thomas. Yeah, that's the nickname we give him. There's a quote from uh, Ernest Yabo, and it says this. When you courageously believe in the power of doubt instead of the power of God, you much see the works of doubt and least see the works of God. And when we spend our lives living in doubt, what we end up seeing in our lives is the fruit, the result of doubt. But when we spend our lives focused on Jesus Christ, focused on the power of God, guess what we see? We see the works of God. We see what God is doing. And so the first time we see Thomas come on the scene is in Luke chapter 13. Verse 13 and 15, and I broke this up just so that we could see the first time he shows up. And when the day came, he called his disciples to him. And he chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles, and Matthew and Thomas. And so this is the first time we see Thomas show up. Thomas shows up because Jesus calls together those that are beginning to follow him. And out of that group, he selects 12 that would be his disciples, that would be his apostles. He selects these 12. And in that group of 12, there's Thomas. In that group of 12, there's Thomas. And this is the first time we see him show up. We see him come into the picture. And so this week, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the fall of this hero. We're going to look at this hero restored. And then we're going to talk about the final thoughts, the application. Of how does this story of Thomas, that we all so quickly jump to label him, Doubting Thomas, right away, how this applies to us, how this impacts my life. So let's start off with number one. Let's start off with fall of the hero. In Matthew 26, 56, it says this, but all this had taken place to fulfill the scriptures of, of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Now I want you to understand something. Notice there, okay? It's underlined and it's a cap, it's bold. It says, all the disciples left him and fled. This was at the point that Jesus had been arrested and he'd been taken to his first trial and the disciples saw that this was not going to end well. They saw that this was not going to be good. And look what it says. Then all the disciples left him and fled. They all ran and took off. If you keep reading the story of the crucifixion, you see that John would end up back and show up, but the rest nowhere to be seen. 
Okay, <laughs> Judas would go off and, and take himself out. And so you're down to 11. John would actually show up. So you've got 10 others who would run and hide. And yet we turn around and we look at Thomas and we call him Doubting Thomas. Well, what about Doubting Peter? What about Doubting Matthew? What about Doubting James? What about the rest of them? Because the rest of them turned and ran just like Thomas did. Jesus gets arrested. They realize Peter denies Jesus. They realize, oh, this is not good. And they all went and ran. John 20, 25 says this. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where his nails were and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. See, and so Jesus shows up. Jesus has resurrected. Mary has gone back to the tomb. The tomb is empty. The stones rolled away. Easter Sunday has come. Easter morning has come. He is resurrected. And over the, the course of time after that, Jesus appears to different people. And he had appeared to different disciples. But Thomas wasn't there. And so Thomas hadn't seen Jesus yet. Thomas had not experienced what the other disciples experienced. Him. And so when they show up and they're like, Thomas, Thomas, listen, we've seen Jesus. Thomas's response is like, prove it. Prove it. And we look at this and right away, doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Remember, all the disciples ran and hid they all took off, and we'll give John a pass because he shows back up at the, at, the, at, at the the crucifixion. So, okay, all but John ran and hid. They all doubted, but because of this one moment, we turn around and we label them Doubting Thomas. But see, Thomas struggled with a lack of belief, a lack of faith that required proof. He wanted proof. You guys say that Jesus is back, and I want to believe, but I need proof. I need to see it. The truth is, is that not far, it's not very different from many of us. The truth is, if many of us look at our relationship with God, the truth is, if many of us look at our relationship with Jesus Christ, we find many moments where we're saying, God, are you real? God, prove yourself. And yet I dare not label myself Doubting Nate. <clears throat> I mean, I don't see many of you. I don't see, you know, on, on Facebook or Instagram, you guys calling yourself Doubting and then whatever your name is. But yeah, we call him Doubting Thomas. Poor guy, because he gets a bad rap. He really does. <clears throat> but don't worry, you're going to feel guilty about calling him Doubting Thomas. And you're going to struggle from now on with ever saying that again after this. So let's talk about a hero restored. Let, let's talk about why we shouldn't call him Doubting Thomas. In John eleven sixteen, 16, it says this, Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go so that we may die with him. Okay, let's also go so that we may die with him. And you say, wait, wait a minute. How can this restoration come before the fall? We just jumped back in time. Okay, Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. There's talks about killing him. There's talks about, do we go to Israel? Do we go to, back to Jerusalem? Do we go to Bethel? What's going on? There, there's, there's a plot against him. How can we talk about a restoration before the fall? Well, listen, this doesn't show his restoration, but what it does show is the potential. Okay, it shows the potential. It shows something. It shows that there's more to Thomas than we give Thomas credit for. Because what happened was, there's this plot out there, and there's rumors that they're going to kill Jesus. They're going to try to arrest him, they're going to try to take him out. And all the disciples are going, well, no, 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 we better not go back there. We better not go, Jesus, what are you doing? Why? And, and the rest of them are, you know, you know they're, they're, they're chickening out here. <clears throat> okay, the rest of them are chickening out here. But what does Thomas say? Hey, listen, let's go too. So that we would die with him. What it shows you is, yeah, you say, well, push comes to shove. He ran with the rest of them. You're right. But it shows you just a glimpse into the confidence, such a, a glimpse into the love, a glimpse into the connection that Thomas had with Jesus. But let's now look at the real restoration. 
John 20, verse 24 to 29. I want to read the whole thing, even though it includes the, the, the fall of this hero. It says, now Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, all right, a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. A week later, okay, a week later, Thomas is with them. They're all together. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. Now, there's a reason why he had to say peace be with you, because let's be honest, if you were in a room and it was all locked up and all of a sudden somebody was standing there, I would hope their first words are peace be with you, too. Because if their first words were boo, we would probably all be screaming and freaking out. OK, doors are locked. Nobody knows we're here. OK, no, Jesus shows up. He appears in the room. And what's his response? Peace be with you. And then what does he do? I, 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 Jesus is, in, I mean, we know he's incredible. And if you don't believe, I'm telling you, you are missing out. Because this, this man, okay, that we call Jesus, this son of God, is beyond incredible in the way he handles things. Last year, we talked about Peter, and we talked about Peter's fall. And Peter's fall was his pride, it was his strength, it was his belief that he could, you know, that he was going to uh, conquer the world. It was his belief that he was going to stand strong for Jesus. And when push came to shove, Peter denies Jesus. He's given three moments to stand with Jesus by his side, and he denies him three times and what does jesus do jesus comes to peter and he doesn't say how dare you he doesn't say you wretched he doesn't say you terrible disgusting person how dare you deny me do no he comes next to peter and he says hey peter do you love me peter do you love me Peter, do you love me? And he gives Peter specifically three opportunities to 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 restore those three moments of denial. Peter, Jesus doesn't just ask him one time. He could have. He could have just said, hey, do you love me? <sighs> Got it all. But he specifically, intimately says to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Why? Because he wanted Peter to know that it was all wiped clean. He wanted Peter to know that you move forward and you don't carry the guilt and you don't carry the shame and you don't carry the junk of the past. And so here we are again, this beautiful, this incredible son of God that we call Jesus Christ. And what does he do? He doesn't turn around and say, hey, peace be with you. All right, let's eat. Peace be with you. Let's hang out. What are you guys up to? No, he says, peace be with you. And then what does he do? He turns to Thomas, already knowing. I mean, how incredible is God? Listen, he already knows the mess you're in. You might as well just put it out there. There's no reason in hiding it. There's no reason in playing games with it. We talked about Adam last, last week. Adam sins, realizes he's naked, realizes that he's in trouble. What does he do? He runs and hides. Jesus shows up in the garden. He says, where are you? And we really think that that means that God didn't know where Adam was. We really think that God was like, where are you? And last week we said, Marco. All right, good. We, got, we, have, a, we have a few. <laughs> It is strange how many times Marco Polo has come up this past week in the most random places. And I'm like, how in the world? I've not heard that term and that phrase and that game in years. And all of a sudden it pops up this week several times. Yeah, you know, God knew exactly where Adam was. He was trying to figure out, hey, Adam, do you know where you are? See, Jesus knows exactly what's going on with Thomas. He knows where Thomas is at. He knows where Thomas is struggling. And you know what he does? He doesn't show up and say, hey, come chase me. He doesn't show up in the room and say, Thomas, I'm here. Poof, disappears, pops up somewhere else. I'm over here now. It's not what he does. He doesn't play a game. He goes right up to Thomas and he says, hey, put your fingers here. Look at my hands. Look at the holes. Go ahead, touch them. Touch them and look and see. Look and see the nail holes. Look and see what, what has happened to me. Here, touch my side. Look and see. Touch and feel. Stop doubting and believe. And we see the hero restored. Why? Because Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. 
And Thomas recognizes something. He recognizes that this isn't just some made-up story. He recognizes that this is just some apparition. He recognizes that the rest of the disciples aren't overcome and overwhelmed with grief, that they have this, this communal vision together, this communal deception together. No, he recognizes that the Son of God is standing before him. His rabbi, his teacher, his master, his Lord, his God, his Christ, his Messiah is standing before him. And everything has changed. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out of your hand. Put it on my side. Stop doubting and believe. And what does Thomas say? Thomas said, my Lord and my God. You want to know, and we want to talk about Thomas and, and, and his restoration process, and, 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 you know, church history has some discrepancies and some, you know, there's some debates to all of this, but there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of evidence that points that, that, that Thomas would go on, like the other, the rest would go on to, to preach the gospel. All right, that Thomas would go on to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of Jesus Christ to the world. It is believed that he would die. Okay, he would die at the end of a spear. Doing what? Talking about Jesus. That he would die at the end of a spear after taking the truth, all right, the truth of Jesus Christ out to India. It is believed that that's how far Thomas went. That he went all the way to India and, and, and brought the truth to those that were there. In India, there's a group of Christians to this day that are called Marthama Christians. And the word Thama means Thomas in their, in their native language. And they believe, to the, and they believe, the descendants believe this day that the reason they have a relationship with Jesus Christ is because Thomas showed up. And Thomas brought Jesus to their, to their world, to their region. This, I mean, this isn't, this isn't a dude who said, I don't believe... And then just, okay, I'm just I'm going home now. It's all falling apart. Let me grab my, my jacket. Let me grab my cloak. Let me get my stuff. And I'm my, I got my sandals. I'm out of here. This is a man who had his doubts. He had his struggles. But when Jesus stood in front of him face to face, he walked out and he spent the rest of his life to his death preaching the gospel. Literally changing the world. And so we talked about a fallen hero. We talk about the hero being restored. Let's talk about these final thoughts. Let's talk about the life application. Let, let's put this together for us so we have an understanding. And, and there's something that we need to understand. And I'm not excusing this by any means. I mean, we did a series on, on rebellion and tolerance. So I'm definitely not excusing this. But we have to understand something. And we should understand something. That doubting is a normal part of the human struggle. It's a normal part of the human struggle. It, it, it's something that God understands. He gets it. He understands that we're going to have our doubts. Listen, Abraham doubted. John the Baptist doubted. Esther doubted. Moses doubted. I mean, we almost have fall of the hero next year already there. Okay? There they are. Okay? And that's not who, who they are. There's, there's, a, there's a list. Um, but yeah, there you go. Okay? All these people that we hold great doubted. God understands that. I'm not saying that, 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 that it's okay. I'm not saying that, hey, oh, you know, just, just go ahead and live your life in doubt or whatever. It's not what I'm saying. But we have to understand something, that, that doubting is normal. Doubting is going to happen. We are going to doubt. But we also have to understand something that, listen, there is some really, really good evidence. There's some really good proof of the Bible and the truth of Jesus Christ. If you, want it, if you want to find it, you can find it. If you want to keep living and keep believing a lie, you can keep doing that. But there is a ton of historical, archaeological, geological, scientific. There's a ton of evidence that continues to point to the real truth of the word of God. It's out there. 
And new stuff keeps being found all the time. And new stuff keeps keep coming up all the time. And they say, listen, how in the world could this could these th this this Bible that was written by all these different people, all these books, all these people thousands of years ago, how could this be true? And then guess what? They go and they find a 800-year-old, a 1,000-year-old manuscript, a 1,000-year-old piece of paper with some words on it. They begin to read it and go, oh, it's the same thing that we have. Time and time and time again, the Bible says that there was a city in a certain place. And we say, oh, that's not true. There's nothing there. Until <sighs> wind goes by. They're like, oh, wait, what's that stone on the ground? They start digging. Next thing you know, they find it. Time and time again, our world continues and the things around us continue to prove that, that, that the word of God is true and that it's real. And so we have to recognize that there's some really, really, really good evidence to the proof and the truth of who Jesus Christ was. In John chapter 20, verse 29, this is the response. This is what Jesus would say to Thomas after Thomas believed. He said, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Now listen, I want you to understand something, okay? Because right away, Daddy Thomas, the other disciples believed. The other disciples saw Jesus and believed. Let's just, let me just put it right there so you understand this. Peter saw Jesus and believed he was alive. Because when Mary went in the tomb and said, Jesus is gone, he's not in there, guess what the other disciples went, went and did? They ran to see for themselves. But we don't call them, we don't, doubting Peter, how dare you? That's offensive. That would be offensive to call him doubting Peter. Peter, we, he, I mean, upon this rock, I'll build my church. We, we can't, we could never call him that. But yet Peter had to go see with his own eyes for himself. Is the tomb really empty? So when Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. He wasn't saying that the rest of the disciples are more blessed because they, they believe without seeing me. No, they saw him. You know who he's talking about? Me. You. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Listen, I have not seen. Jesus has not in the room and said, peace be with you. I've not had an opportunity to walk up to Jesus and check his side and touch the nail and physically reach out and say, there's Jesus' hand. I got it. And yet I believe that there are nail holes in his hands. I believe that there's a spear hole in his side. I believe that Jesus Christ died and gave his life for me. And the Bible says that I am blessed because I've not seen, but I believe. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says this, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is one of my favorite, and I say this a lot. Who say, how many of your favorite? Just the whole thing, probably. <laughs> but this is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in who? In him, not in me, is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots in the streams. It does not fear when he comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. One of the reasons I love this verse is because I love the strength. I love the imagery of a tree being planted and strong and holding strong no matter what happens. And then one of the reasons why I love this verse is because I also hate it. Because then I look at my own life and the wind starts to blow like it blew yesterday. And, and the rain starts to come like it did yesterday. And, and, and all of a sudden there's leaves all over the place. But here it says the leaves are always green. But then I look at my own life and I say Man, the leaves aren't always green. It says here, it has no worries in the year of drought. And then I look at my own life and I'm like, I have worries, even when it's not a drought. 
I look here and it says never fails to bear fruit. I look at my own life and I go, oh, I fail to bear fruit. And so I love this verse, but I hate this. Why? Because if I want to see my leaves always green, if I want to not worry in the time of drought or in the time of good, if I want to never fail to bear fruit, what do I have to do? I have to trust in the Lord and have my confidence in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. James 1, 6, good old James. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. The one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. See, we have to get to a point where we believe, where we trust, where we have faith that God is who he said he is, that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. And sometimes you just got to get to the point where you say, okay, I'm just going to believe no matter what comes my way. See, faith is more than just beliefs or feelings. Yes, we're emotional. Yes, we're, we're human beings. And even the, the most stoic of us, the most rational and logical person in this room still has emotions. Okay, we're not robots. Now, you may shove them all down deep inside and act like I'm always okay. But, but everybody in this room has emotions we have feel. But listen, faith is more than that. Faith is a decision to be committed to the message of the word, to, the, to be committed to the message of Jesus Christ. It should take us beyond that. It's not just this thing that should just waver and come and go. And today I believe and tomorrow shh, I don't believe. And today I trust that God is going to take care of me. Shh, and tomorrow I don't trust that God is going to take care of me. No, that's not faith. That's just nonsense. This blowing back and forth needs to stop. Why? Because I have a solid and firm foundation. Jesus Christ is the son of God. He is the last Adam. He came into this world and he died. Why? So that I could have a relationship with God, I could be restored as a child of God. I need to hold to that. We need to hold to that. We cannot live our lives blowing back and forth wherever the wind takes us. Whatever breeze happens. <sighs> here I am over here now. Oh God, where are you? He's in the same place he was yesterday. <sighs> over here. Oh God, where are you now? The same place he was yesterday. Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Who God is doesn't change. He's still Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He's still my healer. He's still my shepherd. He's still my strength. He's still my peace. He's still my light. He's still my hope. He's still my savior. That has not changed. So I need to, we need to, in those times, in those moments of doubt, hold to the truth and the truth of who he is. And in those moments of doubt, if you don't know and you're struggling with who and answering the question of who is he, listen, the beauty of modern technology, okay, is that you can take your phone out instead of scrolling through nonsense after nonsense. Okay, on social media or, or, or going from, from, you know, one website to the other to the other, just looking at random stuff and new stuff and sports or whatever. The beauty of modern technology is that I can pick up my phone and I have the Bible in four billion different translations and languages, all of that right there. The beauty of modern technology is that there's thing called Google. And instead of looking up, you know, how to fix a leaky faucet, which I'm not saying is bad. I mean, if you got a leaky faucet, fix it. But I can pick up my phone and I can say, <clears throat> and I can type in verses that have to do with faith. Verses that have to do with trusting God. Verses, I can type in names of God and the names of God in the Bible. And I can look up and guess what I can find? I can find lists of verses that tell me who God is. It doesn't get easier than that. We don't got to go in the good old days where you had to open up 
and blow the dust off that Bible and flip all the way to the back of the concordance and look up trust or look up God and then try to flip through and hope you get lucky and you can find the verse you're looking for. No, now you can just pull the phone out and just go, I mean, you probably can even just hit the button and be like, Siri, I need verses on, on you know, and I've not tried this, but I'm sure it probably works. I need verses on the character of God. And there they go and they pop right up. See, there's really no excuse. There's no excuse. And if there's no excuse for me, you sure as no, I'm not going to give you the way out. I'm not suffering in this by myself. I'm sharing all of this. If when I doubt, I refuse to focus on the truth, you know whose fault that is? It's my fault. When you doubt, if you refuse to focus on the truth, you know whose fault that is? <laughs> That's your fault. It's not God's fault. It's right there. I mean, it is super easy. It is super easy. Ready? Here we go. Look, I can <clears throat> open it up. Look, even my face opens up my phone. All right? Right there, look, I have Hebrews 11.1. 1, and it says this. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Right there. I, I don't have to do much. <clears throat> A couple of clicks and boom, there you go. Scripture is right there in hand. There is no reason. There is no reason for me to allow for doubt to set in. There is no reason for me to allow for doubt. Jesus Christ said to Thomas, he said, listen, you saw and you believe, but blessed are those who haven't seen and believed. You know what that tells me? I'm blessed because I've not seen, but I believe. But I have to live in that belief. We have to live in that belief. As we went through this series, we looked at different people. We looked at Paul and, and we looked at Saul and, and, and we looked at Adam and we looked at Thomas. And the truth is that there are people in this room that, that, that you know, not all of you, but there are people in this room that, that fall into different categories and, and you've connected with different people that we've talked about. There are people in this room that, that you look at Paul and, and you struggle because you look at your life and you realize that choices and decisions and things that you're doing don't match up with what God has called you to do and who God has called you to be. You look at your life and you realize that you've made choices and you're doing things that are leading you further from God than to him. And what you need right now is, is, is a face-to-face. Is a, is a face -to -face. What you need right now is, is, is the Holy Spirit to, 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 to put the love of God right in front of your face to realize and recognize that God's desire and plan for you is not to keep going down this road, but he has something so much better for you. There are people in this room that, like King Saul, you have gifts and abilities, but you squandered them because you've made it about you. You squandered them because instead of using those gifts and abilities to glorify God, instead of using that talent, that hard work, that dedication to bring God glory, you've used it for yourself. And you've lost sight of who you are in him. There are people in this room like Adam who have chosen to be disobedient, who made a choice or have made choices they say, you know what, God, I believe you. Because Adam believed in God. He believed in God, all right. He saw him. He walked with him. But have made choices. Well, but I'm going to do it my way. God, I know you're real and I know you're there, but I, I need to do this my way. And you've made choices and you've allowed moments of rebellion. You've allowed moments of tolerance. You've allowed moments of you saying, I, I'm going to do what I want to do in my life to creep in. And it's bringing death and destruction. There are people in this room like Thomas who you're struggling and, and, and you have doubts and you're not sure of, of, of what's going on and, and, and you're struggling with believing that God has, has the power and the ability to be and do what he said he would do in your life. And so there's moments and there's areas where you're struggling with that. And I'm here to tell you that God has a plan far beyond any of the messes that these guys put themselves in. That God has a plan for you beyond any of the failures and any of the fallings and any of the junk that these guys put themselves in. God has a plan for you that functions in love, in grace, in mercy, and freedom. But you have to believe. You have to believe. You have, you have to believe. 
last night I came here and, and was putting the slides up on the computer and, and listening to worship and spending time <coughs> in worship. And, and next thing I know, it's, you know, 1030 and, man, I really should go home and <coughs> just one more song. And next thing I know, it's 1130, really should go home, just one more song. And before you know it, it it's almost midnight. I'm like, I probably really should go home now. But I was in here worshiping and in here spending time with God and in here praying over, over this series, in here praying over all of you and praying and knowing and trusting that God has something great and special. And the truth is that he does not want us to live a life of doubt. He wants us to live a life of faith. He wants us to live a life of confidence. He wants us to trust and believe in who he is. Not in who I am. My life goes far better when I stop trusting myself and I start trusting him. My life goes far better when I stop trusting and stop believing and having faith in my strength, in my abilities. I mean, the math is crazy in the Bible. It says, when I am weak, then I'm strong. How does that make any sense? You want to know why? Because when I am weak, when there is less of me, when I decrease, he increases. When I am weak, when I am out of the way, when I continue to remove myself and my thoughts and my ideas and my desires and my pride and my selfishness and my doubts and my junk, as I move that out of the way, God comes in and all of a sudden I find, wow, my life is filled with him, not with me. Because the truth is, is that it was never supposed to be about me. It's about him and them. Jesus Christ said it. He said when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God. And I'll give you a second one because it's right there next to it. And love others. And so if you're in this room and you look at any of these characters and there's connection and there's struggle, today I want to pray for release and for freedom. Today, I want to pray and give you all the opportunity to find release and freedom. And if you're in this room and you don't have a relationship with God, then today is a great day to recognize him as Lord and Savior. Today's a great day to recognize him as Lord and Savior. And so last night I was here and I was praising and I was worshiping. And, and the last song that I heard, I ended up listening to it. I don't know how many times in a row because it just hit me and, and, and it just kept pounding into my head. And I went home listening to it and I woke up this morning and I put it on and I've not stopped listening to it literally until I walked into this room. Because it had been really weird to have worship going on and me sitting there continuing to listen to this song. And so I turned it off. But the song says, give me faith to trust what you say. It, it, it talks about, about uh, being focused and, 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 and believing in who he is. And believing what God wants to do. And what God wants to do that he wants to take this brokenness. He wants to take this imperfect person. And he wants to restore me and heal me. And he wants to make me like him. The line says, I'm, I'm broken inside. I give you my life. It's a powerful and it's a simple cry out to God to say, God, I need you. I need you. And so we're going to end and this song is going to play. Or at least I'm going to end. <laughs> and this song is going to play. But God is not done. I'm telling you, God is not done. I wasn't here till midnight last night just hanging around, twiddling my thumbs like I ain't got nothing else to do. <clears throat> I, I, I know that God is moving. I know that there are things happening. I know that he is getting ready, that there are people in this room that he is calling to him, that there are people in this room that he is going to set you free. There are people in this room that need to be loved, and he's waiting to wrap his arms around you. There are people in this room that need wholeness and need forgiveness, and God is here to restore you. God is here to set you free. God is here to empower you. There are people in this room that today is a day that you will never forget because who you were yesterday is not who you're going to be tomorrow. And so we're going to play this song. 
And the altars are going to are, are, are available. These steps are available. This opportunity is here for you. If you want to see God move, if you want to experience God in your life, then you are going to have to make a decision. You are going to have to step out. And you say, yeah, but Nate, I could just pray for my seat. You're right, you can. And God can just move in my life and my seat. You're right, you can. But we've been talking about faith. And so I'm going to ask you, in obedience to God, to take a step of faith. And not just one in your heart, not just one in your mind, but literally, physically. Take a step of faith and to stand up and to come forward. And you say, yeah, but that's awkward. It is. I bet you it was more awkward for Jesus when he was up on the cross, beaten and battered. And yet he did it because he loved me. I'm asking you, God is asking you, listen, take a step of faith and trust him. Take a step of faith and to step out and to see what God is going to do. See how God is going to move in your, in your life. And so as this song plays, this altar is open. Come and pray. Come and put it before God. And, 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 and people will come and pray with you. And, 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 and no one leaves here. Do not leave here today missing out on the opportunity of what God wants to do. Do not leave here today in doubt. Do not leave here today not trusting. Do not leave here today with your hope tossed around and your hope in the middle of a storm. Leave here today in full confidence in that God is who he says he is. And that God is doing exactly what he said he is doing and will do in my life, in your life, and in the lives of all those that believe, trust him. Have faith and believe. Go ahead, play the song.